Good morning and welcome to Supporting Students with a History of Trauma and Anxiety During COVID-19. I am Mary Beth Landy. I'm the Senior Trainer uh, and Support Specialist for RTSC, uh, Recruitment Training and Support Center for Special Education Surrogate Parents at the Federation for Children with Special Needs. <clears throat> so welcome, I'd like to welcome a special welcome this morning to both Stephanie Monaghan Blout and Renee Marchin from NESCA, uh, which I always have to read. Neuropsychological, see, I stumble on it every time. NESCA, it's just easier. Sorry. <laughs> Neuropsychology and Education Services for Children and Adolescents. Um, they are a renowned uh, neuropsychologist who are trauma informed therapists. So I'd like to welcome them both. They are going to introduce themselves today. So um, Stephanie, would you like to start off? Sure. So my name is Stephanie Monaghan Blout. I am a pediatric neuropsychologist. I'm a, uh, we're talking, I mean, you could call me a senior or an elder at uh, NESCA. I've been there for quite a long time. And I'm really actually um, excited to present this, this uh, webinar to you all because this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but I'm also really excited because it's really going to be interesting and fun to do this with Renee. Renee and I sort of take the, the opposite ends of the spectrum. We're both originally trained as family therapists, and so we share a view, a systems view, but we also come from, in terms of the trauma thing, really opposite ends of the um, the field and the history of the field. I think I, I started my my work as a, as a social worker in the community-based in community settings when in the late 70s and early 80s when we were first taking the scab off the whole epidemic of sexual abuse and really beginning to recognize that and recognize that trauma happens in kids and it happens to a lot of kids. Um, <clears throat> and so in my career, that's always been a real interest of mine um, and, uh, and I interested in neuropsychology uh, and uh, then have been in Wundeska now for, oh, I don't know, I don't know, 20 years or something in our various in incarnations. And then uh, Renee has, was actually uh, came into our, we were very blessed to get Renee to come in and she was, uh, we worked together very closely at first mm -hmm. and, and now our colleagues, so. Yes. Yes, Stephanie, I definitely agree with you. We, um, we share a common training and background in family therapy, which definitely grounds our understanding and um, our formulation of what what we see in families and what we do and how we treat kids and families. Um, and as you said, um, I have been at NASCA for a, a much shorter term for about <laughs> two years now. <laughs> um, and prior to that, I was at Cambridge Health Alliance um, in Boston providing both neuropsychological assessments and intensive treatment to kids and families who were admitted to child and adolescent um, acute units, psychiatric units. Um, and so, you know, as Stephanie said, um, I come with a very focused kind of trauma and practice informed lens to assessment. Um, you know, so providing both child and family oriented interventions for kids and families in community settings, inpatient settings, safety and risk assessments. Um, and as a neuropsychologist, I focus on often the intersection between neurodevelopmental challenges like autism spectrum disorder and psychiatric mental health challenges, including the experience of trauma, anxiety, depression, um, and the like. Um, and so I'm very interested in kind of teasing out and assessing that combination of, of challenges and figuring out how to help kids who present with that dual challenge. Great. I'd like to thank both of you for being here today. Um, as you you know, know by the number of people who registered, it is a very popular topic um, and I appreciate it. I just want to remind people to put your, post your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, not during the presentation, um, so that we can keep the flow going. Um, and we appreciate um, all the hard work that's gone into this presentation. So let us begin. Okay. Great. Thanks, Mary Beth. All right. So um, we're going to, we always start off when we do these things, but, you know, like, let's identify what we want to be, we, we'd like you to learn from this. And I think um, this is a list of, what, five or five things that we want 
people to really get out of it. We understand that this is a, a pretty large audience and an audience that has a, a, a wide number of, have, have come to this um, webinar for a lot of different reasons from a lot of different places. So hopefully this will sort of cover a lot of those bases. And the first is to really identify what we call the stress, anxiety, trauma spectrum and what that looks like in kids. Um, particularly recognizing the way it looks in school and at home during the COVID crisis. We also really want to talk about what to do about that. And that is, you know, I talk about how to turn off the stress response and make kids more resilient, more available for learning. And um, Renee is going to talk a lot about some of the strategies for positive coping and how to help kids um, be more capable of, of handling the, the stresses that come down their, their the ordinary and an extraordinary stresses of, of our, com our, our common situation. So um, when I st we started this, I was thinking, well, should I talk about trauma and what is trauma and things like that? And again, this is a pretty, this is an audience who has a lot of experience in that, that area, I think one way or another, the personal or professional or both. And so I really thought about, let's, well, what is trauma? When, when we talk about trauma, what does that really mean? And rather than going through all the various kinds, I thought it would be really, what's the, at, the common denominator, and it's really a shattering of the sense of one's, the world and oneself around it. It's that, you know, that all the things that you just took for, uh, for granted, the safeties and the structures and the protective factors just aren't there for you at some point in your life when you're experiencing something that's really overwhelming. Um, I also want to make clear that not there are, we all of us go through traumatic experiences, not all traumatic experiences that result in trauma. And that's going to really depend on a lot of different things. And I think uh, 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 Renee will get into some of those as well. But, you know, um, things like age, health, prior your prior history. Um, you guys are all probably pretty familiar with the whole ACE um, study and the, the, the finding that, you know, as the more hits that people get basically in their life, the more, um, the less able they're able to fight off the next hit and in terms of health, mental health and physical health as well. Um, genetic strengths and vulnerabilities. Um, and then just basically the, 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 the environmental context that they find themselves in. Some of us, you know, when we live in a, a nice uh, affluent uh, suburban communities, you know, things are pretty good here. That's not necessarily so if you live in a dangerous neighborhood. Um, and then kids, traumatized kids is all, are also different too. There's really so much more vulnerable to, uh, to trauma and traumatic experiences. In large part, you know, very briefly because for two basic reasons. One is because they're helpless. They don't have the capacity. They can't get up and run away. They can't get up and tell someone to leave them alone. They can't move. They're really dependent on um, caring adults to take care of them. And the second important reason I think is because their brains are growing so fast. And so at the time, you know, that when, it, when it, we're in a, a period of growth, we're also in a, a time of, of vulnerability. Um, so any kind of hit during uh, a time when uh, various parts of your brain are growing, they really can alter the tra trajectory of your brain's development. Um, and I think what ends up happening to a lot of kids who, who have been, uh, who've experienced trauma is that because they have, their brains learn like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get at something. And they become very good at detecting anything that could be a threat. Of course, there's a cost to that. And the cost is that when you're stuck in threat alert, and I'll talk about that some more, um, number one, you're not paying attention to the things that you need to learn. And secondly, you have a much, there's a physical cost to having your body in that kind of um, hyper arousal state. And it really it, um, heightens the, the, the probability of, of learning problems, social difficulties, physical illnesses, being uh, given inappropriate medications and interventions, and also later on substance abuse. Um, so, I, I think we, we try to think of um, to the stress, anxiety, trauma as a spectrum. So, I looked up spectrum, and it's really the idea that you can't really, there's sort of this, these sort of gradations, but they're not really sort of clear. They kind of go to, you know, get together. You can think of the color spectrum. Um, that's one, one, one thing we often talk a lot about. You know, it's like purple becomes, or blue becomes purple. And so, there's all sort of, there are the same number of, um, factors that are involved in this, they're just at, at different levels of, of, of uh, intensity and impairment. And if you talk about um, stress, you know, just having to be polite to someone you, I always think of the commercial on TV about the woman who's trying to type and the guy comes up with the golf club and the, you know, it's a, I think it's an ad for some kind of financial thing, but that's a narrative, you know, it's a little bit of a stressor and you have to sort of get up for that. To the, the challenge of getting ready for a test, to more overt danger. 
And the very end of the spectrum is the trauma, and that's the shattering, where all of the the the, the hits sort of blow things apart, and you don't, and you and you have to sort of re pull things back, thing back together again. Um, so, um, if we talk about anxiety, and I'm going to talk about this first, just because I'm going to go on and talk about the stress response later. Anxiety is a psychological experience of feeling helpless and out of control, and you. The subjective experience, you know, we think about that, that's the rumination. You can't get your thought, you know, I should have said this, I should have said that. Why did, what's going to happen now, you know, if you're in a problem at work? Um, the catastrophizing, you know, oh my God, I got to go see the doctor. So it must be terrible. You know, there was something terrible must be happening. Um, there's a lot of physical stuff that we associate with that, that um, that has actually a physical basis that we're going to talk about, about that, with muscle tension, restlessness, heart palpitations, stomach upset, a variety of things. We all have our own flavor of how we uh, manifest our anxiety in our bodies, and, and it, it can involve pretty much any system. Um, and those are all really the manifestations of the stress response. Okay. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're we're switching through the but Renee's Renee's got the, the control button and I'm just talking so <laughs> we have to look through the sort of nonverbal communication here. So stress and anxiety. So if we think about, I mean, I think it was something that, that's really recently been brought to me, and I, I I I've been thinking a lot about that this this year. Is that stress is an adaptive response. Stress is what happens when the body perceives some kind of danger. We get ready to deal with it. Okay, and every living thing has some form of stress response that it's critical for survival. I mean. You know, animals have it, people have it, plants have it, you know. Uh, they, you know, plants that exude a certain a, a horrible smell when they feel threatened or when they close up. Those are ways, that's a stress response in a way of protecting themselves. Um, and it's a way of protecting us from danger. I mean, here's a tiger. I always think about this, you know, what would you do if, if, a, if a tiger shows up? You want to be ready to, to, to respond to that. So how do we do that? How does your body do that? Okay. Oh. There's a whole cascade and process that happens, you know, first when, when you, the, the parts of your brain, the amygdala recognizes there's some kind of danger, it sets up a whole cascade of hormonal responses, actually, that do a number of things. The first thing that they do is they switch on the systems that are needed to respond to threat, and that's our sympathetic nervous system that gets, it, gets us up and gets us going, okay? Um, and then switches off the systems that are not essential for crisis response. That's our, our sympathetic nervous system, or the rest and digest. That means and that energy gets really put to where it needs to go. So it's not really important when we're facing a tiger to have our digestive system work all that well, our reproductive hormones or our growth hormones, things like that. All that energy and that those systems get, get put into breathing fast, you know, um, having our heartbeat uh, rev up so we can get ready to move, uh, having the uh, glucose uh, and, and sugar sent to our muscles so we can get so we can be strong. Um, those are the systems that we need to es escape from tigers. Okay, now once the danger is passed, the parasympathetic system, that balance, kind of takes over and calms us all down. Slows down our respirations, our heart slows down, and importantly, we begin thinking again. Because one of the really important things, and we'll hear this from both of us throughout the thing, is one of the things that's not so essential when it's, you're trying to escape from a tiger, thinking. Now, okay. not, not a good time to think. This is not a time for reflection, creativity, problem solving. No, it's a time to run. And so what ends up happening when we turn that off is that we begin to be able to think again. So stress responses, you guys have all heard of these. Um, just let's talk a little bit about them. We'll go, again, we'll get back to these as well. This, the three stress responses are fight, flight, and we always include from the learning perceptions to freeze because that's really important as well. And so when you think about fight, you know, it's not just sort of punching each other. It's the idea of our body gets hyper aroused. It gets ready to sort of respond quickly. Um, that can look like impulsivity, hyperactivity, defiance, aggression. You know, you can think about yourself as when you're really anxious and you're getting, you're kind of snappy, you're irritable, you know, you're not like your nicest part, you're not the more understanding, you're just going to be really reactive. And that's important because, again, when you're trying to escape from tigers, you need to react, okay? Another possible um, reaction is flight, and that's sort of this more avoidant, distractible, spacey kind of thing. Um, this is a, t flight is also, um, it could be, again, some of those, you know, feeling sick, I can't do it, I, you know, I can't, or I got to go, I got to get, you know, a lot of times we think of the, the kid who's got to get that special pen out of the cubby, because, you know, they, they got to, you know, they, they can't do their math unless they have their special pen. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, we, we, we talk about that as, you know, we can say that's an avoidant behavior and bad, 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 bad. But, it, you know, let's think about that for a minute. And also the spaciness, that sort of 
be you may be in your body may be in the room but your mind is not um, you know again when we push that all the way out to the sort of the, 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 the from the end of the spectrum that can be also dissociative but but even this that sort of spaciness of, of, that kids we, we see oftentimes and then freeze is really shutting down it's sort of the difficulties getting started difficulties stopping difficulties making decisions difficulties shifting gears um, one of the things that, that Renee and I hear a lot about from um, from teachers that this is the kid just shuts down and they have to do a behavioral plan to help the kids shut down without a real consideration of why the kid is shutting down. Mm -hmm. And these are often kids who are maybe confronting a reading that they can't do or math that's really difficult for them and they don't know what to do and they just put their head on their desk and that's it and they're done. Mm -hmm. no. um, I think that's a difficult situation. So. We have the, the system, it goes up, we, we mobilize ourselves for threat, um, the threat gets over, we calm ourselves down. And that's a really important system. And that's, you know, that's sort of how we go through sort of life. But the question then happens, what if that shut, loop doesn't shut down? And, and many of you are dealing with kids who, for whom this is really true. What happens if the, 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 um, the threat is more immediate and constant? What if it's the, their danger sensor is too sensitive, so you're reacting to you know, if someone walks in the door and you're and you're all of a sudden and in, in, you know, your heart's starting to race. Um, what if you never get a chance to calm down? What if there, there's something always happening that feels dangerous? In this system situation, the person stays in that hyper aroused state that they're ready for the tiger. And they're always looking for danger and they're always looking ready to respond, even when it's not appropriate and even when it's against their best interests. Yeah. I want to say too, Stephanie, as we're, as we're talking about this, it was, it was making me think about, you know, of course, in our current circumstances and the pandemic yes. and COVID, how this loop not shutting down and being in this more always ready for tiger moment is, is so true for all of us right now and so many kids and families um, and all at, at different levels of the spectrum, as you said, based on our own, you know, pre-existing vulnerabilities or challenges. Um, and so I think you know, it's a it's a an important point around thinking about this loop is really activated for us right now. Um, it's COVID. Which, yeah, and I think it, it sort of points us to maybe we need to get that. Maybe there, we grown ups need to have a a um, limit in terms of amount of time the TV sets on because mm -hmm. the TV sets always kind of blasting this typically bad news, not typically good news. That could be just sort of getting us constantly remembering, oh my God, do I, you know, what happens if, is this ever, you know, going to be over all the different fears that we have around the situation? So, uh, this is a, the point that happens when, when it goes awry, when our adaptive responses go awry, um, or when they're not, or we're in a situation where we can never sort of have that compensatory re rest and relax kind of stuff, um, you know, I think uh, we need to think about that as well. And I, mean, I think a lot of the kids that we have worked with and you, that you are probably dealing with are kids who are no longer in dangerous situations, but their bodies have been sort of built to respond to dangerous situations. So they're still responding to the way they would have when things weren't so good for them, when they were in places that weren't safe, that were really scary, even though that now they're not. And I think that can be very, very difficult and uh, very demoralizing for parents in particular because you've worked so hard to make these kids feel safe and they still they're still reacting as if something bad's going to happen when that doorbell rings so so again so what does this look like and I think this is a, something that we really it's just so important I think I always think about how you know situations how can we make everybody win if we can understand what kids are doing what's happening with some of these behaviors that are so difficult for us to manage as manifestations of of both their threat and how scared they are and their attempts to problem solve i think it's really important mm -hmm. so school kids who are stressed out at school they can be again irritable and defiant they can that's the fight stuff they can be making this is the kid who always needs to go to the nurse's office that's the flight or they can just be shut down and have their head on the desk and they can't, they just can't do anything, right? Um, at home, these are the kids who may be constantly fighting with parents and siblings, refusing to do their chores, won't go do the remote learning, you know, they won't do anything and they're just really difficult to manage. Um, they can also be losing the kids who lose themselves in video games and you literally cannot tear them away from the screen or binge watching TV or YouTube. Um, or they also can be, they can be like simple things like, my shoelace broke, becomes an absolute crisis to them because they can't be flexible and think. They're just stuck in this sort of reactive kind of 
danger threat alert kind of thing and like it just it's just too much they can't even deal with it i think the other point that we want to make too that this just doesn't happen to kids this happens to all of us um, you know and i think uh, parents and teachers really need to be paying attention to themselves as well because when they start doing things like my way or the highway you know got to be going to be really authoritarian when that's not necessarily their style um, especially when kids are saying you can't make me and i don't want to um, that's a real that that's a, a a stress response. They can also be, a, you know, engaging in avoidant behaviors. And these are, I think, you know, the the burnt out teachers who come in late, leave early, take every you know opportunity they can not to be in a situation where they can't, they don't feel effective, and they can't uh, feel like their work is meaningful is really important to recognize. Um, and then there's always the issue of, of substance abuse, and I bring that up because you know I think there's sort of a joke going around about the COVID um, the COVID drink or the COVID cocktail, but I think it's a real temptation for us to, you know, be using, drinking more, smoking more, doing whatever to relieve the stress. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what are the impact of uh, sort of this chronic fright, flight, 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 freeze uh, things? I think, you know, when we think about a brain being trying to be in, in threat alert, number one, the attentional systems are geared on the lookout for signs of danger, and that's triggers, okay? So it could be, um, you know, a lot of the kids that I work with, police, you know, police, uh, anyone in a uniform is kind of a trigger for them. Sirens, fire alarms, um, um, loud voices. Um, for some kids, it's food. You know, there's a, you know, any of that stuff. You know, those kinds of things set those kids off into a major protective mode. But they're all also always looking, sort of keeping their eye out for them. So any unexpected noise could be a tr could could be a triggering thing as well. Uh, their arousal set points again are either fixed at too high, they're too hyper aroused, or they're or under aroused. They're spacing out and they're too little. Um, being also always looking for dangers distorts the way that you see people in events. If you're expecting bad things to happen to you and someone does something that you don't understand or you've never seen before, you're going to interpret that as a bad thing. And then you're going to react in that way. That doesn't do great things for social relationships. Okay. It also drastically limits your capacity for flexible thinking and creative problem solving. And, from tigers is not a time when we think well. Um, so you tend to get, and I think one of the things I always say, if, this, if a kid's doing something weird, this is, a, this is a time when you need to be thinking about, well, are they feeling threatened? Are they feeling, are they feeling stressed? Are they, are they stuck in a, in a response mode here that's trying to get them, you know, uh, protect them? Um, and then I think also it creates conditions of physical discomfort. I mean, being tense all the time, if your shoulders are always up in your air, it's really uncomfortable. And that can really be distracting as well. Um, and the sort of the, again, the, the cost of that sort of like having your body flooded with cortisol and also all these sort of hormones that are there to help you escape from danger. And it's not good for your system and it can cause all kinds of problems eventually. And, you know, again, the ACE study sort of bears that out for us. But, you know, these include hypertension, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, problems with re reproduction. A variety of systems really get hit, can be hit by this. Um, so basically, in short, and I think this is the, the main message we try to, you know, to, to teachers in particular, is that stressed, anxious, traumatized children who are constantly on the lookout for danger are not available for learning. You know, learning really requires, well, we'll go into that. <laughs> but I think that's the most important thing. So when we see kids acting in the ways that we've just described, to expect them to sit down and do remote learning is probably not going to be a winning proposition. Um, this is just something, the behavioral presentation of stress and trauma. One of the things that's really interesting, and I, I, I remember a study that I um, used in my dissertation, it was a long, long time ago, it was in the 90s, I think. Um, they, they looked at people, kids coming through the court clinic in Boston, and these are kids who had already been identified and have, have, having suffered some kind of maltreatment, and less than half of those kids qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD, because they, kids don't manifest um, stress and trauma the way that adults do. And we're trying to fit kids into a, 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 a package that doesn't work. What we do see are these things. We see attention and executive function problems. A lot of these kids get misdiagnosed with ADHD. Well, they may have ADHD, but what's going on with them is not ADHD. That's not why they can't sit in their seat. Their language capacity, competency is really diminished. Um, now, this could be for a couple of different reasons. For many of our kids, people didn't, those first years when we were, were learning language, people didn't talk to them very much. And so that really affects your language to begin with. But again, 
when when we're stressed out, when we're under, uh, you know, when our frontal lobes are not available to us, those higher level thinking processes, um, what really goes is talking, it's communication, it's language skills. Um, kids who are, are stressed out, under stress, are having tremendous problems with behavioral dysregulation. That's how kids express themselves, especially if they don't have language. They get into have behavior problems. Um, anxiety, depression, self-injurious behavior, learning issues. Again, it's really, really difficult to learn when you're always worried about what, who's gonna come in the, coming in the door. Um, weak social skills, again, because uh, there's a lot of distortion that goes on. And again, the, um, I think the risk of, of substance abuse is really high because you know, who wouldn't want to be numbed out? Okay. So, so how do we turn off the stress response? That's by helping feel people feel safe and confident. Those are the two main things. I mean, the major, major thing that we found in uh, any kind of research, you know, from the beginning to the end, I think is so important for kids to feel, have a connection with somebody who they feel, makes them feel safe and cared about and valued. Um, I think, um, so, and safety is found in relationship, that, that's really important. And then when a kid feels safe, all of those, this, the, 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 the parasympathetic system can kick in. They can let go of their, their, their constant scanning. They can begin to relax. They can begin to play. The way the kids learn, learn is playing. You know, they can have, it takes some, and you have to be able to take risks to play. You have to feel safe to play. Um, and, um, and then when they feel safe, they begin available for learning, available for learning. And then they can then acquire the skills they need to meet the challenges of life. Because, you know, you can make a kid feel safe, but they still need to learn how to read. You know, and if reading is one of the, poor reading is one of the reasons why they're, that school is so stressful for them, we've got to do both things. You know, we have to teach them, we have to make them feel safe, and we have to teach them the skills they need to get through life. So, yeah. So I'm going to expand upon uh, Stephanie's discussion and our focus on understanding what do we do? What do we do to manage these chronic and intense fight, flight, freeze responses that we would see in kids and teens and adults? Um, and as Stephanie mentioned, safety and connection is foundational as what we think about as in the research and what we know about positive coping and managing anxiety, stress and trauma as critical for healing and for coping. Um, and so really at the end of the day, we know that relationships really matter with supporting positive coping in kids and teenagers. Um, there's much research um, in the field of resiliency on having a supportive relationship that's reliable, that's consistent, that's persistent is one of the number one resiliency factors for kids that really is a, a scaffolding and support for decreasing this fight, flight, freeze mode and for supporting kids who are anxious and stressed and traumatized. Um, and so, you know, when we were thinking about, you know, okay, how do we capture and kind of understand what that means? One is having that adult caregiver be available for that regulation or that support. And that involves a lot of self care, as we know. Um, and is very challenging in these times within the pandemic and the constraints of remote learning and being home. Um, you know, and, and we know that kids and teenagers, one of the, the first ways that kids learn how to cope and how to deal with stress and how to manage feelings that come up for them is by modeling what they see in the environment. And so this is why having self-care and taking care of ourselves first is so critical as, a, as a, a way to be fully there and fully present to help mitigate this fight, flight, freeze response that we would see in an anxious kid or a traumatized individual. Um, and with that, you know, I think it's critical to think about within the constraints of this pandemic and, and what this has done for collectively our, our world um, is validating and acknowledging, you know, together that this is really, really difficult and this is a unique circumstance. This is really challenging for all of us. And, you know, validation is one of our kind of core therapeutic tenants that we use with families in therapy and in treatment. Um, it's being able to say, yeah, this is real. This sucks. This is really hard. Um, and so that, that's <laughs> critical as a, a way for us to both validate for ourselves. This is hard through practicing good self-care. And then how do we continue to, to be there and validate for our kids and our families, and our students and our clients 
that this experience is overwhelming and activating our fight, flight, freeze mode, like other circumstances may have not or may relate to other circumstances in our past that this experience of chronic fight, flee, freeze mode is bringing up. Um, now, another yeah, thing. Yeah. One more thing. One yeah. is, um, it's also really important because I, I took this stress and uh, relaxation response thing from the Benson Henstry Institute uh, recently. And there, I got a couple of things out of it. But one of the points that they're making is that there are some situations you can't do anything about. You know, yeah. you just can't. We can't do anything about COVID-19. can't do anything. And this is where I think what Renee was saying about that sort of validation. Yes, it sucks. But this is the way it is. And we'll have to figure out what we can do about it. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a cope. That's an important le lesson to kids is that it's some things you just can't do anything about. And we just have to deal with it for right now. Yeah. And I think that goes along with, as you said, the acceptance piece. And there's such a difference between, and it's so hard to automatically want to problem solve and trying to figure out what do we do? What are, and we're in a circumstance where a lot of things can't be problem solved. Yeah. And so we are, you know, in many ways, it's more adaptive to have a validation and acceptance perspective and action that as you know, you know, kind of broad as that sounds is a coping skill to validate and to show that this is what we're feeling and we have to accept what it is. Um, and, then you can go back, and I think the other thing is and then you switch gears and say, okay, I can't change the fact that you can't go out and see your friend and it's really terrible that you can't do that. Well, you know what, let's go have a cup of tea. Right. I'll make you, I'll make you some, you know, sleepy timers. I mean, something like just, something else. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when we think about positive coping and, and what we know on in treatment and in and working with kids in, in therapy or in schools is that, you know, an, another core aspect of positive coping and survival and sustaining amidst anxiety, stress, trauma is building mastery, building self-awareness, self-expression, um, building skills, right? So, you know, there's definitely the validation piece, which is foundational and building a relationship and helping kids regulate through your relationship with them. There's also a very important secondary piece, which is building a child or a teen's sense of mastery, self-expression, being able to do something, in many ways, problem solve within the constraints of our circumstances. Um, and something that, you know, I think Stephanie and I both heavily you know, agree on in terms of our experience and our work with families um, is that being able to figure out how do we organize and understand COVID-19, our feelings, our thoughts, our experiences is so critical to positive coping. Um, and one of the things I'm going to do is share some ways that we can do that or some interventions that could support kids and families in doing that. And, and related it's so critical in when we look at the literature of how we support positive coping in kids, being able to do things and engage in actions and activities and coping skills that allow for discharging and kind of getting out our feelings productively and adaptively rather than bottling them up and keeping them inside. Because if we do that, you know, like a soda bottle, we know we're going to explode if we keep it all inside and just keep shaking things up and getting more stressed and more anxious and more irritated, right? And so we really have to focus on how do we discharge and positively get rid of and express and deal with some of these feelings that are holding up both in our brains, but obviously also, as we know, with a stress response in our body. Um, and so two ways that are really critical to think about how do we do this. One is capturing it, documenting it, and remembering it in an adaptive way. And I think about this in terms of COVID-19, right? All the ways that people in our world are trying to understand and capture and understand this experience. And I also think about this in terms of being a trauma therapist and how we work with kids and families in once we are working on our coping skills and managing our body sensations, our thought processes, the feelings that we're experiencing, we're also focusing on how do we develop a narrative or an understanding of what's happened to me, what has been a traumatic experience that I can narrate and show through examples like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. They have a whole model of how we use narrative. There's clinicians, I was trained in TFCBT, um, and other clinicians who use narrative and documentation and using that expression to positively cope with trauma and stressful experiences. And so in COVID, it's interesting to think about, you know, we've had 
you know, viral time capsules that people have developed for how to narrate and document this experience. Um, you know, people are telling stories using art um, as ways to discharge the feelings and experiences that are occurring during COVID. Um, and as we know, mindfulness, as Stephanie mentioned, play, yoga, deep breathing, nature therapy, things that activate our body are so critical in how we heal and how we support positive coping for kids and adults who are stressed, who are anxious, who are traumatized. Using your body to heal your mind, I think is a critical tenant to think about what are those activities day to day? What can we do to kind of activate our body in a positive way to manage this you know, loop and terrible stress response that Stephanie spent some time talking about? Um, so secondly, one of the things that I wanted to share is an intervention that I've used definitely in therapy with children. I know Stephanie has as well. Um, and I see this a famous, a famous family therapy uh, uh, strategy that's just great. It's we, wonderful. It, yeah, and it's we, really we, great. We use it all the time. You know, I think yeah. in, you know, even in just conversations we have with kids or with families. Um, but it, it's so critical in, if we're thinking about kind of constraints of COVID and what this pandemic is, and we're thinking about how do we use narrative and documentation and remembrance to kind of author and understand this experience, um, this intervention can be particularly useful, I think, for some kids and teenagers. Um, and I'll describe kind of what that might look like with letter writing, for example, and then some other interventions that are also ways of externalizing the problem. What we mean by externalizing the problem, I mean separating the problem from ourselves, right? And so what that means is, you know, I'm depressed converts to depression is really bothering me today. It's really taking me, you know, that blue monster is really driving me nuts today. I can't get out of bed. I can't do anything, right? We're trying to actively separate a problem from who we are as a person. Um, so feelings can be externalized, I, as I mentioned. Um, illnesses, depression, anxiety, fatigue, chronic pain, problems between people even. So fights, you know, limits that are set, you know, when limits happening, when you tell me I can't do this on the TV, this is what I do, right? Or I have to shut off my video games. The video game, game stealing episode comes in and I get upset, right? Um, and then contextual problems. So broader challenges that the world encounters and that are, you know, our collective experience. So these are things like COVID-19, right? Or in other literature, you know, externalizing the problem is used for things such as natural disasters or significant events in the community, um, you know, forest fires, things like that, for example, in California. Um, and so one of the, the ways that we would externalize the problem with kids and teens, perhaps either in the classroom, as a therapeutic intervention at home when you're, you know, sitting around and trying to think of an activity to do with kids, um, is some kids really might like letter writing. And one of the ways that we do that is externalizing things that might be happening for us during COVID. So these are things like, you know, dear COVID-19, you know, this happened and then this happened and I'm really angry at you because this, you know, you know, was supposed to happen for graduation and I wasn't able to do it. Um, you know, other ways that kids have kind of turned COVID-19 into an externalized problem are, you know, dear social distancer, you know, for littler kids, dear Mr. Corona, um, dear senior year stealer, dear quarantine maker, dear worry monster, which you would use or can use for kids who are anxious or experiencing a number of worries during COVID. So, um, as I said, that's a way of writing and kind of using letter writing to manage and tolerate the stress and the anxiety that we're experiencing during COVID. Um, you know, so it might be important for a teenager or, you know, a, a younger child to make it a ritual or a plan that every day that they write that letter or a piece of that letter. Now, writing is not for everyone, right? And <laughs> it's definitely not always the um, chosen coping skill or coping strategy for kids. Yeah, right? yeah, we kind of find that like one of the things that, you know, writing, like I always <laughs> sort of say that in our neuropsych evaluations for like a very special time because usually it's kind of a real trigger. for most, Usually for many, it's many, a many trigger, kids. right. So then how do we internalize the problem in other ways? What are other ways we can do that that doesn't involve writing? 
One is through creation, you know, drawing, collaging, um, using digital images, making videos. I've seen kids doing that where they're definitely more like visual learners or people who learn through images where they're putting kind of collages and visuals together of, you know, this happened and then this happened and making a story to kind of show what has occurred over the past few months. Um, creating a vision board of, you know, here's my roadmap of this happened and then this happened, a playlist, right? Kids love music. So, you know, song one is what I listen to in the morning. Song two is what I listen to at lunch. Song three is before I go to bed at night. Or this song represents, you know, how I was feeling when my mom, who's a first responder, would go to work in the morning, right? And this is the song I would listen to when I would start to think about that and worry about her. Um, you know, therapeutic movement is another way of externalizing the problem that isn't writing letters, right? So dancing, yoga, hiking, nature therapy, as I mentioned before. Um, there's actually a Corona um, art Facebook page where there's, you know, even a community of people who are sharing what they're making and creating to help discharge and channel all these feelings and thoughts that are happening in their bodies and their brains during this time. Um, and, you know, one of the last things I, I will say is that, um, you know, we know that, you know, feeling happy and feeling positive is actually pretty time limited. And what we know in the research is that staying connected to our values and our strengths and what we care about is long lasting and helps us persist and sustain stress and build resilience. Um, and I share this, so this is a, a classification of character strengths. And, and this slide is about, you know, reiterating and emphasizing the importance of staying connected and attuned to what are our values, what are the things that we care about, what are our strengths, what are the things that are going well for us right now. Um, the values and action classification of character strengths is actually, um, you know, a research mythology, and there's tons of research on these character strengths. Um, you can actually, as a kid, I think it's age 10 and above, or adults, you can take a, a quiz that tells you, you know, what are your kind of top five strengths, um, and I know some families have chosen to do that during COVID, you know, they're home, they're, you know, taking a lot of online BuzzFeed quizzes and, you know, they say, what are my uh, character strengths right now? Um, and it's interesting, you know, for example, you know, I, uh, a student who loves nature, you know, being in nature is really critical for them and their top strength was appreciation of beauty and excellence, right? So appreciating the beauty and nature around you is so critical. And being able to give names and language to what we care about, what we value, what our strengths are, being able to think about that, being able to pay attention to that is, is so critical for our positive coping and our ability to sustain stress. I would also think this is also critically important for most traumatized kids spend a lot of time on their deficiencies, on their weaknesses, on their vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And we don't really get to the strengths enough. We don't get to what is important and highly valued and that's meaning. Judy Herman was one of the first, uh, one of the original researchers on sort of um, trauma, really talked about, she had a book called Recovery of Meaning. And it was about how a lot of women who have been in domestic violence and, and things like that really recovered their lives again. And that was through what was really important to them. And this is, starts it off. I mean, it's a positive way to think about what's important to me. Uh, mm -hmm. What do I value about myself? And yeah. how can I use that as a roadmap sort of forward? So I really think this is really cool. I really like this. Thing. Yeah, and I, I will say too, from my experience in being a therapist um, in inpatient settings and also in outpatient settings when I was doing um, trauma-focused CBT and other family-based interventions, um, I definitely used this specific um, via classification of character strengths in both family therapy, group therapy, you know, where everyone would take the quiz and then we would share, you know, what are your strengths, what are yours, and to have a conversation and communication about like, wow, this is what Susie's really, you know, valuing right now and this is what I'm valuing right now, right? And that focus of having conversation and a focus on strengths also, you know, when we, as you said, with thinking about kids who are traumatized, to be able to have a focus on that conversation can be so powerful in therapy or, you know, in treatment at one point. So um, to wrap up, um, you know, one of the kind of, I think, foundational things that we want people to take away from our talk today is to really hone in on this number one resiliency positive coping factor, 
which is relationship and connection and our ability to sustain a supportive, persistent relationship with a child, with a teen, with our teacher, with um, our therapist, you know, with our grandparent. Um, and a responsive adult really is a critical way to recognize, proactively problem solve and figure out how do we support integrating some of these positive coping skills that we've discussed and help to regulate that fight, flight, freeze mode that we're seeing kids get stuck in during this time and also outside of our pandemic. Um, and you know, last, I think Stephanie and I both just want to say, you know, we're doing the best we can and, um, you know, we can always try to grow and heal and change and do things that are going to support us that are in a positive coping manner or help us grow in some way. But you know, just validating and I think accepting that we're doing the best we can and we're trying and this is a trying time for everyone, um, both caregivers and, and children, obviously. Um, you know, that's a connecting force that we're all in this together. Um, so thank you all. Thank you both. Um, that was fabulous.